Oops. Welcome to the Workers and Reformers in the Gilded Age America. Primarily, we're going to be talking about uh, workers for this, this lecture, the part one and part two, but we'll do a little bit of reformer stuff too. All right, sound cool? Excellent. Notebooks and pens at the ready? Off we go. Next slide. Next slide. Oh, oh, there it is. Hi. So, first things first. We talk about women and work. This drives me crazy. Um, everybody works. Not everybody gets paid. So all American women have always worked. Even rich women work. Even if it's at being a professional hot wife or being a volunteer lady at the local country club or whatever. That's still work. It may not be as hard as your work or even my work, but it's still work. It's unwaged work. So the point is that all American women have always worked. Some women work for wages. Some women work for not wages. And keep in mind, they're all the domestic work that women do, both housework and child rearing, is always unwaged, right? Unless, of course, you're a woman doing that for money because you're a nanny or a maid. So only poor women historically, so for most of American history, certainly before World War II, only poor or working class women uh, worked for wages because, again, if we think back a couple of lectures ago, there was a notion that middle class women, real women, were supposed to stay home and be full-time wives and mothers. So, poor women have always worked for wages. All women have always worked. All women have, um, all women do, or almost all women do, a lot of unwaged domestic work, reproductive work, and volunteer work. I know in my community, when we, there's something volunteer, like we're doing the food bank now to keep people fed, that's a bunch of women, and mostly older women, uh, doing that work, probably because we're the ones at home, right? So, by the mid-19th century, again, from where we were talking true womanhood, slave women, and now working women, poor women who went to work in factories and stuff, uh, most Americans people lived on farms. So that work was, is again, it doesn't even look like waged work to most of us now, but men and women worked on farms and your wages came when you sold your crops. And in America where women didn't own property, farms have always been considered men. So farming women's wages and work also disappear, right? Excellent. Next slide. Well, some statistics first. In 1850, um, one in four households employed at least one domestic worker, what you and I might call a maid. And if you're thinking, wow, that's a lot of families who had maids, the difference is that it used to be because there's two things going on there. Because there were so many immigrants and immigrants worked, immigrants worked so cheap that regular middle class people could afford a full-time maid. Uh, and two, the nature of housework in the 19th century meant that, the, that even a middle-class, full-time, stay-at-home mom couldn't do it all by herself. So you often had a maid who helped you with the cooking, the cleaning, and particularly laundry was considered extremely arduous, because it was arduous. So, lots, so if one in four households employed a maid, that means there was a bunch of women out there working as maids. Uh, by, by 1870, so only 20 years later, you can see that that number has dropped slightly from 1 in 4, or 25%, to 1 in 5, or 20%. So that's a little bit of a drop, but not much. And it tells us for much of the 19th century, or the 1800s, middle class people had servants. Um, and that means there was a bunch of people for whom that was an, an, a, a job. And indeed, by the mid-1800s, if you think back, uh, I think it was the, the, the True Womanhood lecture when I had the, some slides about immigrant numbers, and we had huge numbers of Irish immigrants in the 1800s before the Civil War. Um, Irish immigrant women, they, one, that was a big immigrant group, two, more Irish women came here than Irish men, and three, uh, they tended to work in maid service. What will happen is after the Civil War and after what we, we'll call the Great Migration, which we're going to get to in the next slide, uh, African-American women will replace Irish immigrant women 
as the largest group of domestic servants or maids in America. Yeah? Which you've seen in movies and read about in books and some of you may even have family members who lived. In California, I would suspect that we have high numbers even by the early 1900s of, of Hispanic or Latina maids, but countrywide, those numbers have never been very big outside of California until very recently. All right, next slide. Migration, I just referred to this. This is this move in the 1900s. You have the Civil War in 1861 to 1864, uh, the, the end of which abolishes slavery and, and frees the slaves, uh, but frees them into a world that doesn't particularly care for them, that has all the racist ideologies, all the economic places and all the economic situations in place. And again, think about a family that had been slaves for generations and suddenly you're free. Free to what? You don't own a house. You don't own any land. You don't even own your own clothes. You don't own anything. And then somebody's like, good news you're free. Um, so you have this mass of poor people living in the American South, and what'll happen is it'll take them a couple of decades, kind of one generation, to amass enough money to move out of the South and to move north to where there are factory jobs that they can work at. And so that's, so you get, the slavery is abolished in 1865, and by 1900 you begin to get masses of black Americans moving out of the American Southeast, so right, Mississippi, Alabama, Virginia, that band of southern states, and into the northern states, um, particularly the northeastern states and the north Midwest. So think Chicago, Detroit, New York, right? Um, um, and we call this the Great Migration. So people aren't immigrants. They're not coming from someplace else to America. They're migrants. They're moving within the country, the Great Migration. Anyway, many, many, many black women found work as maids. And, and while this work was, and, and, and continues to be, low-waged, low-power, um, um, not great work, for many African-American women, this was a real step up, that they because they had gone from working in the fields because they freed slaves but didn't give them anything. So most freed slaves continued working for their for plantation owners growing cotton for wages so low they were essentially subsistence subs, subsistence wages. So for a lot of black women, the move north and the shift from agricultural work or field work to maid work was a step up both in um, prestige and in wages. It sounds ridiculous. But here you see this third um, bullet point. Uh, in 1910, a Chicago housemaid made three times more than a maid in the South. So even if you were a maid in Chicago, it was better than being a, sh a maid in Alabama or Mississippi. And she made five times more than somebody who worked in the cotton fields. And, and five times more is a lot. So again, these jobs that we think of historically as bad jobs were for many people a step up from worse jobs. Uh, we know that black maids and, and maids really pretty much for all of world history, including now, prefer to be day maids. That is, they prefer to live with their families and come into a place and work and go home. Live-in maids generally have a lot less freedom uh, because you live with the family you're taking care of, and that also means the family that you live with can work you kind of around the clock. So, and then give you like one day a week off. So most most African-American women who went north weren't willing to take live-in work. They only wanted day work. It's where they work a certain amount of hours and then you went home to your own life. And that seemed a lot less like, because it was a lot less like being owned by the family that employed you, right? Next slide. Picture. Oh, good, a picture. Uh, I think this is a great picture. It's a, a 1910, so we're talking the height of the Great Migration. And um, and you see here, this is an extended family. You've got uh, a bunch of people together who are related in some way because they're traveling together, multi-generational aunts and uncles. I don't know if they're related because of the sisters or the husbands. It looks like sisters are related, but it might not be. It's hard to know. 
But also you get a sense there, see, well, they're clearly not rich. They're also clearly not poor. So these are like, again, people who had not poor, poor, not like rags, poor, making subsistence wages, poor. They've got enough money to have a decent set of clothing. They've got suitcases. They have hats. Um, that's, that's when people move. When you're desperate poor, you can't afford to move. You're trapped. So there's a tiny, they're not middle class, but they're not poverty struck. They're respectable working class. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, next slide. All right, and here's a map that gives us an idea of where people went. These arrows, they end up in places that we now call the Rust Belt. Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, the Rust Belt. And we call that the Rust Belt um, in American history and American culture because those are all cities that had big steel manufacturing uh, uh, places. They Not only they manufactured steel, but then made the stuff that you made steel out of. Cars, washing machines, trucks, anything big and metal. Uh, made in these towns, these sort of heavy industrial towns. So they're not making um, shoes, socks. It's not the textile industry like was Massachusetts or even in LA, but 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 s stuff you made out of metal, steel stuff, the Rust Belt. And again, you see people coming from Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Texas, Louisiana, and going north. Um, to the places where the factory jobs were, that those steel factories would have hired black men, not black women, but again, uh, lots of made jobs for black women in the North with an expanding white middle class that it could afford to hire them. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna go back to maids for a second. Next slide. And in the 1800s, most waged women worked as maids. We tend to think about waged work in the, 18, in the 1800s in the industrial age and the years right after the industrial revolution. We tend to think of it as factory work. And we're going to talk about factory work pretty soon because what will happen is you'll get a small contingent of factory workers in the 1800s that will expand every decade and get larger and larger and the maid class will get smaller and smaller. But I do not want us to forget that most of the women for most of the century would have worked as domestic servants. So, good solid work. Yeah? Next slide. Talk about early factory workers, shall we? Um, our first factory or industrial works often did piecework. And indeed, piecework has been something historically that women often did because it's a flexible kind of job you can do if you have families. Um, and if you're thinking, what's piecework. That means you would go, and you get this particularly in the textile trades. So you'd be a woman and you'd have some sort of cart or, or, or wheelbarrow and you would go to the factory on, on say Monday with your cart and you would get a stack full of things that needed to be sewed. Then you would take them home. Oh, and they would have also rented you a sewing machine. Um, and so you'd take them home to your rented sewing machine and you would spend the week sewing these pieces together and then you would take them back to the factory and you would get paid by the piece. So if you sewed a hundred sleeves to a hundred uh, bodices, that would be X amount. And if you did 200 sleeves, uh, that would be X amount times two. <coughs> Hold on. Okay. I'm recording outside and my dogs are bad, bad dogs. Um, there are a very small number of women who worked in places that we would think of as typically male factory places or male workplaces, mines, bars, shipyards, non-traditional female work. But for most women, the kind of factory work that was considered appropriate for women was textiles, so anything to do with fabric and clothing, and then shoe factories, uh, uh, particularly before 1900, so in the 1800s. Uh, factories like to hire women because they could pay them a half or a third what they paid male male workers, which is shocking and dismaying. But consider that even in 2020, the national average women make 80 cents for every dollar men make. So we're still not there. 
right? Oh, gosh, so depressing. Anyway, hey, let's look at the picture on the next page. This isn't so much a picture. It's not a photograph. It's a print. Uh, but you get a sense. What you have here in this factory is they're making some kind of round, like, pipe thing. I don't even know what it is. So this is, it's it's kind of... <laughs> okay, I'm back. Sorry. Bad dogs. The neighbor boy is dumping the trash, and the kid, the dogs are acting like they've never seen him before. Anyway, um, 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 but you get a sense here, it's a room full of, you get sort of how crowded these factory floors were. Um, you could imagine how hot it was, this many people, this many machines going. Um, notice like these got these belts that are coming down from the ceiling to run it. So you'd have one big engine at the end of the room and it would run all these belts, uh, which is not very safe. So it, it, it's a fairly benign looking picture, but if you imagine for a second that it was hot, that it wasn't very safe, um, that it was probably dirty, and that these women were probably making half to a third what men were making doing a full day's factory work in some other factory. And then it's like, then the picture's a little less charming, right? Next slide. We talked about this uh, two, three weeks ago when we did the True Womanhood lecture about how what the industrialization gives you is it gives you urbanization. That is, the industrial economy makes cities. So what will happen is factories will start setting up. And the first picture there on the left, in 1820, you get New York, Philadelphia, and Baltimore getting slightly bigger because people are putting, owners are putting their factories there. And then people will go to those places because the owners put their factories there. And then owners are like, ooh, people are coming to this place. So owners will put more uh, factories there. And what will happen is all of these cities will grow exponentially. So that in the, the second picture there, the one on the right, it's only 40 years later. But look at the ex look at how many more big cities you have and how the big cities, New York, uh, Philadelphia, uh, have gotten bigger. And, and some of the places that weren't even really on the map in 1820 have turned into cities. Chicago, Cincinnati, Cleveland. Rochester up there um, on the Erie Canal was a, a center for a flour milling and um, textiles, uh, uh, etc., etc. So if you're thinking, why in a women's history course am I looking at cities? It's because this is increasingly Americans will, will move to cities and, and they will work in these factories. And we often think Americans means men, but really in American history, it's, it's just about as many women working in factories as it is men. They're just, it's poor women, and they're working for lots smaller wages. Yeah, yeah. Next slide. Oh, here's me explaining piecework. Oh, I already did that. Darn it. Anyway, piecework is the central industrial economy for families, particularly women and children in the 1800s. And you're like, children? Children? Children shouldn't be doing piecework. Well, sure. Um, for most of, of, of the 1800s, children did a ton of factory work. Indeed, oh, there'll be a bunch of sort of do-gooder ladies, social justice ladies. Remember, if women are middle-class real women under true womanhood are supposed to be more moral, that it gave some women the sort of notion that they had female moral authority and they could go out there and do social justice work. One of the things women uh, uh, fight against in the 1800s is child labor. And, and, and what's really interesting about this, it turns out in America, it was almost impossible to make child labor illegal because factory owners love it because you can pay children even less than you pay women. Um, and, and the only way that they would get eventually get fact, child labor outlawed was not so much by making it illegal for children to work in factories, but instead uh, by making school mandatory. And it occurred to women in the late 1800s that if they got mandatory school attendance laws passed, children would not be able to go to factories. And politicians who would not vote for restricting factory ages because they had business owners uh, uh, in their pockets who were saying, if you vote for that, you won't get any more money from me. These politicians also couldn't stand up and say, I'm not for children going to school. Anyway. That's, that was a slightly off the track, but I think it's really interesting. 
uh, I told you piece, piece work is a kind of employment where you get paid by the piece. So we already kind of covered that. But if you want to pause this and write that down, you knock yourself down, out. And, and, and then piece work can be done both in factories. You could work in a factory and get paid by the piece, but you could also, a lot of piece work is done back in people's apartments by uh, everyone, as you'll see in this next picture. These are uh, cigar rollers. So they've got piles of tobacco leaves there, and they're sitting in in the um, in the their rolling rolling cigars. And then the woman down at the end is sewing. So you've got the children are working on on cigar rolling, and mom's doing some probably only renting one machine. So you've got one person who can do piecework, textile piecework, and three people who can do handwork uh, because cigar rolling is handwork right? And everybody's getting paid by the piece. And you can bet not very much. If children are doing it, you can bet it's low wage to work. Yeah. Notice too, it's just like, notice that little, they probably all live in that room and the room beyond it. And there's probably also a dad. There's probably some smaller kids. Can you imagine how crowded? Yeah. Next slide. Oh, you could bet that they were bad. Early factories were entirely unregulated. When you hear the people on the, cons the political right and the conservatives babbling about the evils of government regulation, remember that government regulation is the only thing that keeps this from happening. That is, when governments don't regulate the workplace, then owners aren't going to do it because owners are going to do just like slave owners did. They're going to they're gonna work their workers as hard as they can and pay them as little as they can and have the conditions be as cheap and as unsafe as they can to maximize profits. Capitalism is good for owners. It's bad for workers. Uh, so this is in the early days of the Industrial Revolution when uh, the rich guys ran the government, much, much as they do now, uh, there's no regulation. So these, these factories tended to be either really hot or really cold. They were almost always dirty. And here I mean not just, ooh, that's dirty, but sort of like stuff in the air. Textile factories full of cotton fibers, which cause white lung, which will kill you. Uh, 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 iron factories full of metal filings, which will kill you, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And super dangerous. Like that one picture we saw, all those belts coming down from the ceiling, but not protected. So imagine those whirring all the time and how easy it would be to get your fingers caught in one. These big sewing machines going all the time. Or later on we're going to look at the um, the um, Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, which is just workers crowded into a place, locked in to a place where a fire starts and they can't get out. Ugh. Also really, really long work, long hours. Um, in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s, women worked 12 hour days, six days a week. So too did many children. In the 1840s, they'll have what they call the 10-hour movement. That is a movement to get the, the work week down to 10 hours a day, six days a week. And, people, and they fought for that because that was an improvement on what they had. And again, keep in mind for all the women working in all these factories for all these hours and these terrible conditions that there's no child care. So what do you do? You either you live in an extended family where somebody stays home and watches the kids, grandma or one of the sisters or the oldest kid, or you leave the kids unsupervised, or you put them with somebody who's dangerous. One, God, there's a really famous serial killer in the 18, early 1800s. I can't remember her name. But anyway, women would give their, they, they would have a baby and just not be able to keep it because they had to go to work. So they'd give it to one of these, they called them, they called them baby farmers. And the idea is this woman would keep the baby for a couple of years and then give it back to you. Well, this woman would take the money to keep the baby and then she'd kill the babies. And she killed, apparently, hundreds of babies. And, but women, can you imagine? Women who gave up their babies to baby farmers, even temporarily, can you imagine how desperate they were? Yeah, it's a terrible system. There's nothing good about this. Next slide. Here's a picture, and again we get a sense um, that it's crowded, that um, 
that if you're sitting close to those windows, that might have been nice on a sunshiny day, but it also might have been hot. That if you're sitting far away from the windows, the light might have gotten, gotten bad. What I particularly like about this picture is you have rows and rows and rows of very young female workers. And then see the dude with the tie? Now that guy, who's probably getting paid five times more than the rest of them because he's a man and he's a manager. Um, and they work in these. That's it. This When we talk about the triangle shirtwaist fire, um, the triangle shirtwaist company, the rooms that those women worked in looked a lot like this. So keep that in mind or you can come back and look at it again. All right, next slide. So these factories are environment. They're not just, they're, they're disasters in a lot of ways, but they're on top of being sort of workers' rights disasters because you have long hours and low wages, health and safety uh, disasters because they're unsafe places to work. They're also environmental disasters. That one of the things we forget in the, is that not only do governments make sure that we work a reasonable hour for a reasonable wage, or they should do that, um, but they also make sure that factories can't just spew anything they want into the air or the water or the ground. So in the 1800s, there was no regulation on any of that. So there were days apparently when the textile mills in Massachusetts, they'd be like dyeing things blue. And then they would, when they were done, dump all the dye on the river and the river would run blue one day, then it'd run green one day, and then it would run red one day. Uh, the, the smoke in New York City was so bad. Um, there was so much black particulate matter in the air in New York City in the 1800s that white fell out of fashion because you couldn't wear it out. You'd get little black particles of soot on yourself. Um, um, the air quality in these places, uh, you get people crowding together in cities, but cities hadn't yet figured out how to do basic sort of, how do you pick up the trash? What, what do you do with people pooping and peeing? In, in, a, in a crowded place, you can imagine the disease running rampant in cities like this, much like it's doing in New York uh, with COVID-19. Um, just all kinds of bad things about this. Unregulated capitalism. Never good for human beings, except the 1% who own things. Yeah? Next slide. Of depressing things. Um, so you see there a city... The garbage is just piled high because they haven't figured out how to get it picked up. And imagine the health and safety standards with that. See also the laundry hanging out the windows. Um, down there you see uh, 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 all the factories just spewing uh, uh, smoke. And then the notice of cholera, that's about um, polluted water. And, and in, in, a, in an America where the cities grew faster than the infrastructure did, Clean water was a real problem for a long time because you get cholera from having uh, water contaminated with fecal matter. And the reason you don't get cholera anymore is because your water has all been run through water sanitation systems. And yay, 21st century. But uh, not in this world. Not in this world at all. And this is a world inhabited not just by American men, but by American women and American children. And it's pretty grim. Oh, no, no fun. Oh, no fun. Next slide. You have it. The end of part one. No fun. Once again, Peg bombards you with bad news about the past. Oh, the past is just an icky place, isn't it? Anyway, uh, we when you finish up here, go to part two of the lecture, and I'll see you there. Sound good? All right. See you, peeps, in a second.